Morning, everybody. My name's Dave, and let's say thanks to these guys and gals one more time. Um, I say guys and gals, and you're probably wondering, who is the other girl besides Stacy? But, you know, that's just our little secret, I guess, for this week. Um, we're starting a new series this Sunday. This is called How to Be a Christian Without Wishing You Could Start a New Religion. And we're talking about all the intricacies of belonging to a church and how to make the most of it while simultaneously making the best of it. And we've got a little guide for you here. It's a church survival guide. You can pick it up in the lobby for, I think, 10 or 12 bucks, or you download it for $1.99. And it is based off of the Rule of St. Benedict, which is an ancient Christian document from about 600 B.C. that gives monks practical advice on how to get along in a monastery. Now, n none of you have to be monks, and this clearly isn't a monastery, but the idea behind that old thing is essentially, how to get along without killing each other. And that's kind of this thing, too. So we're going to start in the book of Acts, chapter 2, which presents the absolute best the church has ever been for the 2,000-odd years that the church has actually been around. Now, I want you to pay attention to this, because when people preach out of the book of Acts, chapter 2, there's all this good stuff, and we'll read it. You know, they're sharing, there's miracles, people are jiving along, and they're giving out of their possessions. And, but, but usually when people preach about Acts 2, what they say is, this is what God wants for us, which is true, and then they make everybody feel bad that their church isn't just like Acts chapter 2. But, but here's, here's the thing. There's actually not any other church that's like the church in Acts chapter 2, including the church in Acts chapter 3, or the church in Acts chapter 4, or the church in Acts chapter 5 through 28, or whatever it is. There's no church like it in Rome, in Thessalonica. There's no other moment ever where the church is at her best. So when we read this, you've got to realize, like, this is the apex of church life. Okay? Let's check it out. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. And they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Now, this is the best, and we ought to aspire to this, but what I want you to notice is that never... Do we have this level of holiness, harmony, or fellowship again in the New Testament? In fact, in Corinthians, you got people who are essentially wife swapping in the middle of church. Uh, in Ephesians, they're almost breaking out in fist fights. The Galatians are so frustrating, Paul actually says, You fools, like they're driving him nuts. In fact, for the rest of the New Testament, church is full of people who squabble and sometimes fist fight who send their faces off and who are greedy and whose pastors and leaders are constantly tearing their own hair out when they can actually get the facts straight and stop preaching heresy. And that actually sounds a lot more like the churches we have in North America today. But, but here's my point, okay? Never in the rest of the New Testament does God say, you know what, actually, church is kind of dumb. Screw it. That never happens. Like a week after the ascension of Jesus, you have this beautiful expression of faith and family. And then things kind of deteriorate. But as they deteriorate, God never says, you know what, this was a stupid idea in the first place, just to, you know, join Kiwanis. Like that never happens. He always, always, always reinforces that if you're going to love and serve Jesus, you've got to be in the church, living as the church. Always. You simply cannot study the New Testament and come to any other conclusion other than the fact that you got to be here with us even though we kind of stink. And yet, today, most of us, if we're honest, go, you know, church is kind of dumb. I'm not sure if I'm going to keep going. I'm just going to do like a private thing with me and the Lord. I'm going to get home and I'm going to watch online. 
by which I mean I'm going to look at E! News Daily and maybe have the West Winds player on in the corner on mute. I mean, that's kind of how we think it's going to go. But, but you got to learn to make the best of it, man. You really do. Because the only people who can help you know what Jesus wants and how to faithfully follow Jesus are, are people like us. And, and we're not any better than you. It's just that somehow when we all get together, our worsts cancel each other out. And our bests remind us of who God is calling us to be. So as near as I can figure it out, there's really four people involved in God's church. There's you, like you as an individual, uh, and then there's him, God, and, and then there's them. Now, whenever we refer to them, we must always insert air quotes because it's not them, it's them. You can even put in like a little Beyonce in there, them. You know, you, you, but what, what we really mean by them is like the people it feels okay to hate. You know, the, the hypocrites, the frauds, the jerks, the, the losers, the people who hurt our feelings, the people who betrayed it, them. And then last but not least, there, there's us. There's the people who say, we've given our lives to Jesus and we are here together to figure out how that works best in this life. Now, you'll notice, I, I, did, have, I did have hand gestures for all of that, right? right? There's you, and there's him, and there's them, and then there's us. So what I want you to do um, is, is turn to the person next to you and, and just kind of walk through these hand gestures. Just point at them. You know, that's what your fingers are for, right? P pointing out at others, you know. So, so point at the person next to you and, 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 and repeat after me because this is important, okay? You are at your best with him. They make it worse. but we make it better. It's true. You are at your best with God. They make it worse, but we make it better. Thank you. Thank you. I am a doctor, and I'll be here all week. <laughs> now, what I want to do this morning is just kind of roll through each of these four pronouns because I, I, I think they all reveal kind of gaps in our understanding about church. So, so let's start with you, and I'm going to refer back to the church survival guide from time to time and the little rules. So, so let's start with rule 4.1. Your, our true humanity is godly. We discover who we are meant to become by learning more about who God is. This is the first most important thing you gotta figure out about spirituality. That God loves you as you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. You gotta keep changing, man, from now till you die. And if you want to figure out what, like, the best possible version of yourself is, th then don't take an Enneagram or watch Oprah or figure out what kind of snowflake you're supposed to be. No, no, no. The best possible version of you is found in him. God designed you. God made you. God has infinitely good plans for you and with you. So if you want to know what the optimum Dave McDonald looks like, then, then i got to look to God not to David. Because I only know what I know now, and God's saying, dude, you better not be done, because C- minus is not okay. <laughs> and this actually, I think, is the thing that, that many Christian people fail to understand, is we think, well, once we give our lives to Jesus, now we're kind of done changing. No, 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 no. The first change is not the last change. You're just getting started. I mean, this really is why we have so many hypocrites in church, is because they go, well, I'm a Christian now, so... I guess I can go on being crappy because the Lord loves me anyway. Well, he does love you anyway. But he loves you so much, he actually wants to help you become a version of you that, that you're going to like a lot more. A couple years ago, we did this ad campaign, uh, Come Dirty. You guys remember this? We did stuff in the movie theaters and television. And, and, and the whole campaign was this, that we don't care who you are or what you've done or how filthy you are or how sinful you are or how goofy you are. You come and hang out with us. You can come dirty. And, and around about the time that we were sell, having all this, this come dirty ad campaign stuff, uh, one of our leaders went, went weird. Um, and they started doing stuff that clearly the Bible says don't. And, and I remember a conversation with this gal, and she said, you know, I can't believe you're challenging me on my behavior. You're such a hypocrite. I said, what are you talking about? 
She said, well, you told everybody that it's okay to come dirty. And now you're mad at me because I'm doing dirty stuff. And I said, yeah, you can come dirty, but you're not supposed to stay dirty. If my kids are running outside in the backyard and I say, go inside and get in the bath, I don't mean go to the neighbor's house, get hosed off, and then I'll finally let you in my house. No, I mean get your dirty, filthy toes into the bathtub, and then I'm going to scrub you within an inch of your life till you bleed. Get in there. But, but the point is to get cleaned up. The point of being connected to God is that he made you for more than what you're experiencing now. But in order to experience the best of what he's got to offer, we, we got to change. I, I got to be different and I got to keep being different all the way till the bitter end. Now, he, here's where I think many of us go wrong. Is when we turn our attention to God, we do it in like little snippets. Right? We think that we have a spiritual life and a normal life. But, but you don't have a spiritual life. You just have life. And we talk about doing daily devotions, by which we mean spending focused time with God, reading the Bible, and praying. Well, the truth is, you shouldn't do devotions. You should be wholly devoted. Now, obviously, you can't spend every minute of every day reading the Bible. I get it, right? But, but, but the point is not that you sample God. And, and here we go. This is from Rule 8, I think. You want to throw that up there, Sid? The point is that you don't try and make God part of your life. You recenter your entire life around God. God is not something you do, like I do CrossFit or you do Pilates. You know, you, you do not hop on the God treadmill and run for 15 or 20 minutes and then unplug it and put him in the corner. It, it doesn't work like that. You no, know, he, he's everything. Or he's nothing. And, and the goal, this is uh, rule 8.12, the goal is to make every moment of every day sacred. To experience focused time with God regardless of what's happening around you. And, and what I mean by that is, is, is that you, you've got to learn that when you're in a conversation with somebody, God wants to be part of that conversation and you will benefit from inviting him into it. Now that doesn't mean that you have to like name drop. Hey, Billy, good to see you. And the Lord's happy to see you too. No, 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 no that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is when you're talking with somebody, you're, you're always kind of inviting God to, to interrupt you, to think, well, maybe there's something I can do to bless them, to help them. Maybe, maybe I have something that they need or that they might want. Maybe, maybe there's something I should be listening for. Maybe they're hurting and I can offer some comfort or counsel. Or I mean, that you're, you're, you're on the clock, so to speak, for God. And, and when we talk about the fact that you are best with him, we're talking about the fact that you find your whole life in him. And he's reinvigorating and reshaping your whole life every day in every moment. Now, I've only talked briefly about you and about him, but I'm going to move on because I really want to spend most of my time talking about them. Because if I'm honest, they're the ones who make it worse. They're the ones who make all the trouble. If becoming the best possible version of yourself only involved you and God, we would all look like Brad Pitt and have the character of Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> Instead, it's kind of the other way around. A bit sad, really. Oh, come on, that's funny stuff, right? <laughs> the, truth, the truth is, other people get in the way. I mean, if it's just you and the Lord, you go, oh man, I kind of screwed up, and you know, God's yelling down at you, McDonald, quit being such a wiener. Sorry, you know, and, and then you sort of move on. But, but the truth is, is when somebody else sees you screw up and then they tell everybody else about it and they post it on Facebook for the next, like, decade, well, it's kind of a bigger deal, right? The truth is if somebody else screws up and, and then they cover it up and they try and lie about it and you feel like they're getting away with something that they shouldn't really get away with, well, well that, that, that makes it really complicated. And they are the ones who tend to screw up church and life and faith. But, but please notice, there's a reason we refer to them in the pronoun. It's because more often than not, we're, we're not really sure who they are. And by being deliberately nonspecific, we never actually have to deal with them or find any kind of resolution. So a couple years ago, I'm talking to a guy, he's a new pastor in town, and he says to me, he goes, man, I've heard some weird rumors about Westwinds. Are they true? Well, I don't know. What rumors have you heard? Well, one of my congregants told me that 
that nobody at West Winds, you know, believes the Bible, that they don't even read the Bible. They don't read the Bible. Which people at West Winds are you referring to that don't believe or read the Bible? If you tell me, I'll probably show you the visitor from your church that Sunday morning. <laughs> no, but we make up these things that they must think or that they must do or that they must believe, but we don't really know who they are. So, so let me define who they are to help you. They are the people who take your focus off of Christ Jesus. That's really who they are. I mean, think about it like this, okay? When you give your life to Jesus, it's like you are looking up, in a sense, at him. You've got him on a pedestal. He is elevated. He's the king. He's the Lord. He's the whatever, right? Your whole posture is focused on him. Your hands are raised to him. You are saying, anything you want, I'm yours. I've given you everything. I have shifted my allegiance entirely to you. And we adopt this posture. And of course, the church is full of people like you who have given everything to Jesus. And you've got to imagine that we're all standing kind of shoulder to shoulder looking up at him. And they are the people who cause you to stop looking at him and start looking at them. Either because they're hypocrites or because they're jerks or because they're doing something distracting or because, they're, or because you feel like they're getting away with... But it could be a bajillion reasons. The point is that it's, there's always a temptation to stop looking at Jesus and go, hey, why are you guys doing that? Stop. And when they don't, we, we move away from Jesus to deal with them. And when I move away from him, I become one of them. Is that too many pronouns for a Sunday morning? <laughs> I'll tell you why this is so important. About 12 or 14 years ago, Westwinds had what I think you might nicely call a church split. And I won't go into any of the gory details. It was a very painful time in the history of our church. And looking around, I see probably at least 20 of you that are sitting under the lights that, that survived West Wind's apocalypse 2000 and whatever it was. But, but something weird happened in that a handful of people, literally a handful, took their eyes off of Jesus and made some bad decisions, did some stuff that really isn't excusable, and became them. And then half of our entire adult congregation, I am not exaggerating, upwards of 500 people over a three-year period of time left our church because they stopped focusing on him and started focusing on them. They started taking sides about which one of them was right or wrong, and they started wondering why nobody was punishing them, and then they wondered why more people weren't still like them, and then they wondered how they were doing, and listen to me, 500 people? Now, my quibble isn't really with the, you know, handful, five-ish, that did something stupid in the first place. I think they've sort of regretted that since but 495 other people through sheer lack of focus or discipline or leadership or whatever got their eyes off of Jesus onto somebody else's business and disappeared. That is the size of my entire childhood congregation just wiped out in three years because they got focused on them. Now, those 495 people are just like you and me. Normal, good, whatever. But that's what happens when you take your eyes off of him. Now, let, let's imagine that, uh, that we're all in like a satellite group together. We get together with our satellite group on Friday night. That was a lot of fun. We had some new folks there. We horsed around and had a good time. But, but let's imagine that we're all together in this group, and, um, and Darcy's in my group. We'll pretend. You're not in my group, but you could come. You could hang out. You know, whatever. 
Uh, and let's imagine that, that Darcy goes weird, okay? And she starts, you know, she takes her eyes off of Jesus and she starts being an idiot. And I don't know, she's smuggling pandas illegally into America or whatever, you know. <laughs> now, what I ought to do if I'm Darcy's friend and a follower of Jesus is I ought to I ought to kind of keep my focus on him, but work my way backwards and go, hey, Dars, what are you doing? That's crazy. Knock it off, you know. But, but I ought to keep my eye on Jesus. But what most of us do instead is we take our eyes off of Jesus and we turn around and go, Darcy, what are you doing? And then we get mad at Darcy. And we get madder and madder and madder at Darcy for this, you know, panda thing. Good example. And, and then, and this is the kicker, and then we go to the other people in our satellite group and we say, hey, tap, 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 have you seen what she's doing? She is such an idiot. Do you know how bad she is? And now not only have we taken our focus off of Jesus and put it under Darcy, now we are the people becoming a distraction away from Jesus. I'm no longer one of us. I'm now one of them. And what's totally weird is, even though I'm one of them, I feel like I'm holy and righteous and right because freaking Darcy is smuggling pandas. <laughs> right? I've got the moral high ground, but, but truthfully, I've totally betrayed my allegiance to Christ. Avoid, this is a rule of something or another, avoid gossip and slander. Oh yeah, that's a good rule too. We'll come back to it maybe. Go to the gossip and slander. There we go. Rule 6.6. 6.6.6.6. Rule 6.6. Avoid gossip and slander because the more we talk about others, the more others tire of hearing us talk. That's a little bit sphinx-like, I understand. But the, but the point is this, is that like your job is not to fix Darcy. Your job is not to fix them. The truth is, they, whoever they are, will always be there. And in fact, their numbers will always be growing. And the more attention you give them, the more likely you are to stay healthily connected to us and keep your focus on Christ. And if your true humanity is godly, if you find the best possible version of yourself by investing yourself in God, then your growth has now retarded because you're looking at them instead of him. I feel like there should be a pop quiz afterwards with like a little cube and you have to put you and them and him and, and just make a little prepositional diagram. I think that'd be exciting. Yeah. Now, we talked a little bit about you. We talked a little bit about him. And we talked a little bit about them. Let us also now talk about us. Remember, we are the people who orient our lives to Christ Jesus. We are the people who submit to the authority of the scripture and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We are the people who are committed to locking arms and looking after each other in times of difficulty, crisis, isolation, and confusion. We are the people who will not abandon you. Christian people must always look to one another when they need counsel or comfort or prayer. Rule 11.8. Because the truth is, this life is difficult, and we need you just like you need us. Now, you might sit there and go, well, wait a minute, Dave. You're promising an awful lot from the church. Oh, I, I am, actually, but, but there's a catch. You can't just come, like, on a Sunday morning and feel like you're one of us. Because the truth is, as, as inspiring as this teaching and music may be, nobody knows you. Because when we get together on a Sunday morning, we're just sitting in the dark. So, like, if you get fired, we don't know how to reach out to you. We, we don't know how to, how to help you. We don't know how to take care of you. We don't even know you. But if we know you, then I guarantee you somebody will be there pray with you, somebody will be there to look after you, somebody will be there to love you, somebody will be there to give you counsel, somebody will help you get back on your feet, somebody will help you with job placement. With I guarantee you that you are not sitting 10 feet away from somebody in this room who will literally give you the shirt off their back, the, to 
problem is you just don't know them. You got to find some way to know them, and that's on you, man. That's totally on you. Now we got ways to do that. I mean, we, you know, Jess was talking about that earlier, but but at the end of the day, it's it's on you to meet somebody, and to actually be part of of us. Now, you might say, well, my my life is perfect. I own my own business. I'm never going to get fired. I'm independently wealthy and have need of nothing. Well, fantastic. Awesome. You have no problems. So excited for you, except maybe the problem that you're a jerk, but still, so happy. But, But the truth is, there's people in this room then that need you. If you got your focus on Jesus, who gave up his life for you so that you can give up your life for those around you, that then, then you got a responsibility to the other people in this room to, to help them, to look after them, to, to, to be like what we read about in the book of Acts, to be sharing and believing and learning and developing and growing. So even if you don't need something from somebody else, how about lending somebody else a helping hand? And of course, you might sit there and go, wow, I'm totally ready to help. Nobody ever asks for help. That's because we have no clue who you are either. I got a church full of people I don't know. It's like strangers. Like, and, and the truth is, we all have a responsibility to know and be known by one another as we keep our focus on Jesus. And, and that's honestly when that book of Acts stuff is going to happen. When you're connected, when you're serving, when you're involved, when you're giving, when you're making friends, that, that, that's when all of a sudden we can grow and learn and share and be developed together. And, and so what, what you've got to do, man, if you're sitting in this room right now, you've you got to stop worrying about them and get your focus back on him and understand that he wants you to change and grow and develop with us. And I think this is the single most important truth you will ever learn outside of what's written in the Bible. That you are at your best with him. And they might make it a little worse. But we make it better. Let's pray. Lord, thanks very much. Not only for your spirit and your word, but your church. We are a ramshackle bunch of weirdos, Lord, and we admit it. Of course, so were the disciples, so were the patriarchs, so were the prophets. In fact, pretty much everybody you've ever worked through in the history of the world has been just as screwed up as we are. And so we thank you, Lord, that there's no bare minimum level of perfection. All you're looking for is people who will focus on you and submit to your spirit. So so that's who we want to be. We want to keep our eyes on you and quit worrying about them so that together, Lord, we can work with you to heal the world. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, we're just going to take a few minutes and we're going to pray. We're going to hear some scripture. Um, I, I would like to say that, uh, that this comes easy for me, but... I've been walking with Jesus for over 30 years now, and um, I still have to interrupt myself or, or have him interrupt me uh, throughout the day uh, to pray, to, to read, to spend time with him. And uh, sometimes I have little rituals that I go through, little things uh, that I say to myself. And I have to put myself in certain situations so I can, uh, so I can center on him. And um, so why don't we take the lights down here for the next few minutes, and um, I'm going to read something that uh, sometimes helps me, the things like this, and, and let's, let's just pray, because we have, we have a wonderful opportunity here, if, if you're like me, and, and you don't naturally gravitate towards times of silence and prayer, um, then we have a wonderful opportunity on the weekends, at, at bare minimum, to, to take that time out. So as we close our eyes... As we breathe in and breathe out, we're going to think on some things. So we're going to breathe in the breath of God, recognizing every breath we have is from God. We're going to breathe out our cares and concerns. We'll breathe in the love of God. 
We'll breathe out our doubts and our despair. We'll breathe in the grace of God. Breathe out our fear and frustration. Breathe in the breath of God. Breathe out tension and, and turmoil. Breathe in the love of God. Breathe out our haste and our, our hurry. Breathe in the grace of God. Breathe out waste and worry. We'll sit quietly before the Father who gives life and love to all creation. Sit in adoration before the Son who redeems us from our sin. Sit in peace filled with the breath of the Holy Spirit who renews every single fiber of our being. Sit in awe before the glory of the one God, Father, Son, Spirit. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But it is God so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago.